Hello. It's so great to uh, be here back in Boston, <coughs> seeing um, all you friends and um, uh, practically family. It's like going to a re uh, family reunion without all the drama. Um, I want to thank Joan Reed really for helping me to get to this point. Uh, fellows for your expertise, your ambition, um, and uh, Cynthia, Cynthia Hodges and the Reed Scholar um, Committee for allowing me to speak uh, in front of you. I'm actually a sub, a disclaimer for uh, Seiji um, Hayashi, uh, but in, even in this crowd of very culturally expert, um, excellent uh, people, if you can mistake me for one person, it would be Seiji. <laughs> so this is a talk on healthcare disparities in lower resource international settings. I'll be talking from the perspective of someone who worked mostly for large NGOs in Rwanda, Liberia, and Indonesia for about six years, but also as a CEO and founder of a, of a, a company, a cloud-based software company that makes doctor work faster and safer. Um, my take-home points are these. Uh, first is, um, You can apply healthcare disparities um, framework to help guide policy and programs in the international space, um, but you need to alter the definition that we usually use in this country. Um, the second is that um, digital solutions in these contexts are a no-brainer, um, uh, um, but what is good over there has to make sense and be good over here, otherwise you add to those disparities. And finally, uh, that anyone can start up um, uh, a business, um, but who uh, can survive the 10% the that do uh, really, really depend upon a balance between uh, cost, quality, and time. Okay, so let's start with uh, a definition of healthcare disparities to get everyone on the same page, and that's mostly from codified by the Institute of Medicine in uh, 1999, and that is uh, healthcare disparities are uh, differences in health quality, i.e., outcomes, uh, because of racial and ethnic uh, between racial, racial and ethnic groups, not a result of access-related factors, patient preference, or clinical needs and appropriateness. Graphically speaking, um, again, it holds uh, access, essentially insurance, um, as, uh, as even, right? It, uh, it controls for that and says that even if you have the same ability to pay, you're going to have a disparity in health care and health outcomes. And those fall into two categories, essentially provider bias and prejudice and structural inequalities or racism. Okay, so let's put you experts to the test and test your knowledge. Is this a healthcare disparity? Healthcare disparity is fun. First, a black patient refuses treatment because she can't trust her Asian doctor. Disparity, healthcare disparity or not. All research shows that it is not the patient, what the patient brings into the interaction with the provider, but what the provider is putting onto the patient that distorts trust. In other words, it is the doctor's responsibility to earn or not destroy trust. A white patient refuses treatment because she doesn't trust her black doctor. Yes or no? Under the definition, no, because healthcare disparities about, about racial and ethnic disparities between majority and minority. So, and then relatively speaking, whites do not experience inequities in the healthcare system and by definition cannot be a subject of racism in systems that support uh, the majority. A res resident doctor decides not to use the interpreter phone to give discharge instructions to a patient in a preferred primary language of Spanish. Boom, boom, boom. Yes. This is an act of prejudice. 
It's saying you're not important enough to understand your discharge instructions, the treatment plan, the diagnosis itself. Finally, there is no pediatrician working 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. where I work at Metropolitan Emergency Department in East Harlem. Yes. To the extent that it is the standard to have pediatric services in the emergency department in New York, and the only place that doesn't have it are where all the brown and black and yellow people live, that becomes by definition a healthcare disparity. Okay, this is Princess. She lives in Liberia. And we're gonna do the same thing. Is this a healthcare disparity? But since you haven't probably been to Liberia, raise your hand if you've been to Liberia. It's a great place. Some health statistics. 150 doctors in the whole country. Three pediatricians in the whole country. Not one orthopedist, not one cardiologist, not one radiologist. The income there is about $1.50 a day. And the MMR is 746, over 100,000. Here, even with that New York Times horrible article about disparities in maternal mortality in this country that ranges from 11 to 40, right? That's over 20 times higher than our worst case scenario. And finally, the child mortality rate is 74, where here it is six. And just so you don't think generally that children do better than birthing mothers, the ratio for those indicators is uh, different by a factor of 100. So maternal mortality rate is per 100,000, but child mortality rate and neonatal mortality rate is usually per 1,000, and so if you convert it, it's 7,400 per 100,000, so for 7.4%. Okay, so Princess presents in diabetic ketoacidosis, basically dying because she can't process glucose. The diagnosis is delayed for two days because the physician assistants taking care of her have never seen diabetes, diabetes ketoacidosis, and the doctor who was on call isn't there. How about this one? Once conscious, I happen to be rounding that weekend. Oh, she has DKA, let's, let's treat her. It turns out Princess doesn't have money to buy food, and the hospital doesn't provide food. Or how about this? At discharge, Princess is told to buy insulin, which costs $40, even though her family makes $30 a month. Do any of these meet the definition of disparities that, that we just talked about? No. Because if you recall, the definition talks about that it is not about your need is not about the protocol. It is not about the access that determines the disparity. That is why I would argue that we have to come up with a different definition for disparities in the international context. And that would be this. Disclaimer again, I tried to look for a definition for healthcare disparities in resource poor contexts abroad and I couldn't find one. So I came up with this. Differences in healthcare quality and outcomes that are primarily a result of access related factors and clinical inappropriate care relative to what, would ex what one would expect at a as a citizen of a just world. Okay, so with this definition, let's talk about how digital solutions are imperative to addressing healthcare disparities abroad. You only have to spend about five minutes in a place that's poor in the healthcare system, and that realization will be knowledge. So imagine this. You cannot run a healthcare endeavor with this type of medical record keeping. If anything, worst case scenario is a proxy for the type of care that's being delivered. But at best, it's a way to obfuscate or hide the stories that are in those charts and what type of care the patients receive and should not receive. So, digital. 
when I was helping to build Ebola treatment units during the Ebola crisis, I discovered that in the 60 year history of Ebola care, that no one had ever written anything down. People were too scared about getting Ebola from the writing implements. And so they would just try to memorize the care or yell it over the fence. And then I thought, does that have something to do with the stable 50 to 90% mortality of Ebola treatment units? So you don't, you don't want to write anything down because you're worried about yourself. How about tapping something on um, an iPad, waterproofed? But as been hinted by some of the speakers, not all technology is created equal. I've been very impressed with, in the NGO world, the real push for health messaging onto dumb phones. Um, the idea that if poor people can hear from rich people what to do, they're more likely to do it. Dialogue is usually something like this. Is your baby breathing fast? If so, go to the doctor immediately. The hospital is dirty. Last time I brought my child there, he died. Is your baby having diarrhea? If so, go to the doctor immediately. So this brings me to the golden rule of technology, that you would use it here, that it makes sense here, that what is good enough over there is good enough here. My pet peeve with this is when every time I receive something that's not my family and friends in text, I pretty much delete that. And the people that implement these type of programs, they pretty much delete those t messages too. So that's why I started a company in 2018. And essentially, it's a cloud-based software company that helps doctors make the right decisions faster. Essentially, they run their diagnostic and treatment decisions through a series of checklists. Now we're a little bit above 250. And in return, we can provide very rich data about how entire health systems are doing, but also how the individual um, doctor is doing. So we're working in clinics, emergency, room, um, emergency rooms, and health centers. And essentially, this is the flow. The doctor is about to make a decision about after speaking with the patient and examining the patient. So they pull up what they think it is. In this case, I'm going to choose pelvic inflammatory disease. And then a checklist will appear. And then within this checklist, as they select what applies or doesn't apply, the system writes the note. So in this case, there was a lower abdominal pain, there's vaginal discharge, you can't walk, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, the checklist will look something like this. And we take every opportunity to try to teach and guide the decision making, assuming that this is really pelvic inflammatory disease. So in the upper left, you see that this is just a basic, basic description of pelvic inflammatory disease. The second is a differential. We also remind people, hey, by the way, this is the criteria. You better see that or you don't have pelvic inflammatory disease. And finally, we have a red light, green light system, sort of a gaming system, where the doctor can do whatever they want, but when they close that note, it's recorded as red, green, or, or, or red, or you know, however they did. So in this case, it's saying, wait a second, you didn't get the diagnosis right. You said, what? How did I not get the diagnosis right? You would click that box, and essentially would say like, well, you got most everything, but to really make that diagnosis, you need to either show cervical motion tenderness or agnexal agne tenderness. And then the ideal user, they'll then go back and say, oops, I have to do a pelvic exam to make that diagnosis. So they'll go back, they'll do that, they'll do that uh, exam, they might find cervical motion tenderness, and then it would go to diagnosis positive. In this case, then they'll go back and say, well, I feel so good. I got it, I got a smiley face on the diagnosis. In this case, the, the the imaginary user got the treatment right, and they can confirm that by again looking at uh, a tree. The net effect is to build a very rich dashboard of results that I frankly haven't even seen in this country. We can tell 
the individual or tell the leader of the system if people are receiving the care according to the evidence base. Of course, no one really cares about that. What they care about is this. They care about the business of medicine. So if we can show them how many patients were seen, how much revenue that meant, what are the top drugs being used, what drugs don't you have that you need, then we can get this, which is probably the more interesting information. And together, it defines what Dr. Woodson was saying is value, the ability to link the quality of healthcare with how much it costs. So how have we done? I think we're doing okay, at least in terms of what we set out to do across our client base. We've been able to increase adherence to protocols from a baseline of 30% to 80%, not across the disease of the day, but all diseases and in a fairly quick fashion. And we sort of cook the books. If, you, we, if the whole system is based on a checklist, you're obviously you're, you know, you're gonna follow the checklist. The other exciting part is that, it's what most governors or you know, health policy people are excited about, we're able to decrease the use of medicines pretty much about by 50% across the board. Now the doctors who own the pharmacists or the pharmaceutical companies, they don't love that. But in, at least in terms of these public facilities, they're all about that. And, um, in this case, we define overuse as any un, unsubstantiated use of an antibiotic or, or um, antihypertensive or five, more than five medicines in one, um, uh, to treat one diagnosis or um, any two medicines in the same category. So a pretty low bar. Well, you would think now we'd be a, Fortune, whatever, 100, 100 um, company, or was it 500 or 100? I, that's, that's how much I am in the, uh, the business um, lingo. You would think that we'd be very successful with the results. And I'm very happy with the results. But the fact of the matter is the client often wants other things. So they'll say, well, this is really great, but the internet turns off four hours a day. Can we give you an online version? Or, this is really great, but can you WhatsApp every patient two days after they come here to see if they feel better and allow them to respond? Or, this is really good, but we have problems stealing, uh, people stealing our drugs from the pharmacy. Can you come up with a pharmacy management system? So, we've had to adapt to that because otherwise people aren't going to buy our product. So, my <laughs> message on this is like, you really do got to listen to your clients, but it's sad. It's difficult. You really, you do learn a lot. Like for example, I, was, I, I, was, I discovered that, that, our, that the doctors really were saying, like, yeah, we, we prescribe medicines, but we don't, they're not even available in the, in the pharmacy, right? And then it like clogs the whole system and then they have to go back. So yeah, so we had to create the thing on the right. So when you prescribe something, you can see what's available in the pharmacy. So that type of uh, adaptation. So that's been great, but in terms of running a business, you really have to balance feature development with the cost of innovations and the time of uh, uh, development. I think this is called like the triple threat triangle um, of, uh, of business, and that is one focus, a focus on one area necessarily takes away from the other areas. So like you can produce a great feature, but those features cost money. And if you're a poor startup, that can you know, be your, uh, be your uh, death nail. Or you can say like, okay, we're gonna spend the time to do something, um, but then you lose out on customers. So it's really those organizations that can balance these three, you know, probably the smaller organizations that can balance these three effects that uh, will determine uh, success or failure. I guess I'll just conclude with a story. This was the first baby in Indonesia that I saw uh, die. And I recall feeling so satisfied with myself that 
I would teach the doctors when culturally it was to you know, hold all sick babies, um, MPO or nothing per mouth. I was so proud to teach the healthcare staff how to treat this baby using traditional means, right? I wrote it down, I did a lecture, I'm sure I did some grand rounds, and then I come back a week later and that baby's not there. And I remember holding that baby and thinking, I, for whatever pathological reason, love this baby almost as if it's my own. Why wouldn't I do something to prevent this in the future? And so with a series of experiments and checklists and then uh, using things electronically, if we fast forward just five years, um, this is just one of our health facilities in remote uh, uh, northern Sumatra, which is part of Indonesia. And um, they're using our system. If you ask the staff how they feel, they get angry, they say, when the power goes down. And they feel proud that for the first time, because the doctor's often not there, or the doctor's overwhelmed, that they have a type of, of clinical decision support that wasn't there uh, uh, before. Meanwhile, the patients, they're impressed that there are computers around, but it's not that big of a deal because they always thought that they were getting the best possible care anyway. Thank you.